Hi, everybody. How you guys doing? I'm really good. Yeah, I'm doing really good. Um, man, it's a real privilege to be here with you guys. I think I'm, every speaker is supposed to say that, right? But uh, I really, I actually really feel that way. Um, reality, San Francisco, um, as, a, as I've gotten to know Dave and Dave over the last uh, few months, uh, there's just so much overlap of passion and values with um, what we're doing uh, at Door of Hope, right in the core of Portland. It's a, it's a young church. It actually began the same year, the same summer as uh, Reality San Francisco. And uh, we're trying to be a presence of Jesus and a witness to Jesus right in the core of urban Portland. And you know, when you do that kind of thing, Jesus does his thing, and uh, it's a wild ride. That's just all I'll say. And so um, it's fun to meet people who are on a similar journey in other cities. Um, you guys, this is my, uh, my wife and I arrived here Friday afternoon. This is our first weekend away from our tiny children in two years. So thank you. <laughs> so that's why it's also a privilege, because it's just thank you. That's just the greatest gift. And so um, we arrived like at Friday at noon. This is our first time around San Francisco from my wife and I. And so we promptly walk 18 miles of your city over the last <laughs> 36 hours. And it's, the, it's such a great place. You guys, this is such an awesome city. It's the second best city in the world. <laughs> <laughs> the first is, of course, Portland, right? And uh, this is, uh, where I'm born and raised. So anyway, but, but really, like, this is, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm doing this for free. They paid me to get on a plane kind of thing. But like, it's just really, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for, for having me down. Um, back in January, uh, uh, Dave and Dave, the two Daves, uh, and I got together and Dave asked for my help. Dave Lomas asked for my help in architecting this series. So back in January, they were praying and thinking about this series that you've been in, uh, in the gospel according to John. And so uh, Dave and I had met and he asked for my help. And so we spent a whole day exploring the Gospel of John, thinking about it, praying about it, and then putting the series together. And uh, he, he said that I should come down and be a part of it. So that's why I'm here. But there you go. That's why I'm here. And how's it, how's it going? John, the Gospel according to John. Yeah, so, um, man, like, imagine, a, try and imagine a more profound work than the Gospel according to John. And both it, its subtlety, its beauty, and its revelation of who Jesus of Nazareth is, who, who, who he was, what he said, what he did, and what that reveals, not just about history and who he is, but about who, who God is. And so that's what you've been tracking through in this first, through the first half of the gospel according to John, John 1 through 12, about stories. It's all been stories of Jesus meets somebody, and there's some tension or Jesus says something that's puzzling. Imagine Jesus saying something confusing, right? And so, and then like they, people misunderstand him, and then Jesus does nothing to defuse the tension. He just like says even more strange things or whatever. And then it ends up with Jesus having, making these long speeches about himself and who he is. There you go, right? It's been every week, right? <laughs> so as you've gone through John chapter 1 through 12. And what these stories are designed to do is is create scenarios where Jesus begins to reveal who he is and who, who God is and how the two of those are really close together. But it's all changing, right? Actually, today, um, it's kind of a, a turning, a hinge point in, in the series and in the gospel according to John because all of a sudden, we've been covering, you know, like a, a two-ish years and 12 chapters, gospel according to John. Now we're transitioning today into the section in the second half of the gospel, but specifically chapters 13 through 17, called the Upper Room Discourse, and, and we're going to begin the series from here on out called Life with God. Two and a half years, 12 chapters, the rest of the book, about three days. And specifically, chapters 13 through 17, you know, huge, long chapters cover one night. So just think, think about how the, the story works like that. It's like slow-mo, <laughs> right? It's like fast motion and it's like slow-mo where you're in the room. And Jesus has these final words to give to these closest followers of him, those who have, who have stuck with him and who are having that final Passover meal with him. And it's the night before his arrest 
and the execution and the trial and so on. And so Jesus is trying to, he has one key piece of news he has to break to them. He's been trying to tell them for a while, but they're clueless. But he's really got to try and communicate now, and that's that he's leaving. The language he's going to use, we're going to see that. He says, I'm going away. And what he's referring to is the fact that he's going to be arrested and hung on a Roman execution rack and then buried, and then he's going to be raised from the dead. He's been trying to tell them about this, but it's like the moment's here. And after that, the way that he is with his disciples, the way that Jesus is with his disciples, it's going to change. And so he uses this language, I'm going, I'm going away. And they are going to think that that's really bad. <laughs> but Jesus thinks it's really good. He says it's a good thing. Because he says, I'm going to come back, but it, and I'm going to come and be with you, but it's going to be different than how I was with you. I'm going to be with you by sending the person of the Spirit. And so that's what we're going to uh, explore today. And so let's just actually hear Jesus' words. This is what he says to them right at the beginning of, uh, of the, the uh, upper room discourse. He says, my children, this term of affection to refer to the disciples. He says, I'm going to be with you just a little bit longer. And you're going to look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I'm telling you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. This is how he opens the conversation. I'm going away. And they're really troubled by this, and they ask him all these questions. But then he says these, these words. He makes a promise to them. He says, listen, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. And who's that? The Spirit. The Spirit of truth. Now, so let's just pause real quick here. Look, so look at the, the vocabulary being used here. I've been with you. Now I'm going away, and another, another advocate, um, which is a, a word that's talking about s someone who comes alongside another person to help and to guide them. So like think of an iconic image, like think of, you know, Johnny helping grandma across the street or something like that, right? So it's like an advocate to someone to come alongside to aid and sustain and to, and to help. And so Jesus says, There's, I've been that for you right here. I'm a human, Jesus, I'm right here, with, I've been with you guys, but now there's another guide and helper coming, and that's the Spirit. Now listen, the world's not going to be that stoked on the Spirit, because it doesn't, it's like, well, where's the Spirit, who is the Spirit? It doesn't see Him, it doesn't know the Spirit, but you know Him. He's going to live with you and be in you. And then look at his last sentence here. He says, no, I'm not going to leave you. As orphans, I'm going to come to you. You're like, wait, Jesus, you just said you're going away. But now you're saying you're not going to leave us. You're going to come be with us. I thought you are going away. Are you coming or are you going, Jesus? You know, make up your mind. And so pay attention. Do you get it? I'm going away. But that's a good thing. I'm going to, another is going to come and be with you. And so in that sense, I'm actually not leaving you at all. I'm coming to be, do you get it? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, okay, welcome. <laughs> you couldn't pay me $1,000 to explain the Trinity to my son in, in two minutes. Well, we'll make a video about it for the Bible Project one day. Then we'll have six minutes, and then we'll try. But uh, right now, there you go. So I'm not going to try and unpack that right now. But here, Jesus is saying there's a new character coming into the story. You guys think it's bad that I go away. I'm telling you it's good, because Jesus, he's, he's more than a human, but he is a human. He can be in one place and one time, he's in the room with them, 12, they can all hear him. But he, 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 if, if the Jesus movement is going to spread, and if Jesus is going to become a personal reality and presence to every one of his followers as the movement spreads and as more people learn about Jesus and are compelled to give themselves to following him. If it's gonna stay, if it's gonna stay in this room, then of course he could just, you know, doesn't have to go anywhere. But if it's gonna leave this room and expand, he has to go. And he has to come and be with them in a different way than he has been up to this point. You guys tracking with Jesus? So he says it in a different way, right here, John chapter 16. He brings it up later. He says, very truly I tell you, it's good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him 
to you. So here, he's going again, <laughs> but then he's coming also at the, at the same time. Do you get, okay, all right, I won't, that's an old shtick now. I won't use that anymore. But you get the idea. Jesus, Jesus is going to come and to be with his disciples, but in a different way than he has been. He's going to be with them in the person of the advocate, the spirit. Okay, so let's just stop right here. Um, and because here, here's what Dave actually asked me to do today. <laughs> so so we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to these sayings of Jesus about the Spirit in the upper room. But I, for the most part, I think in our culture, and Portland culture is very, very similar to San Francisco culture in terms of its spiritual climate. When you use that word spirit, there's 10 people in a room but about 15 different meanings of that word in that room. You guys know what I'm saying. It's like the famous saying, you ask three rabbis, you'll get four opinions kind of, kind of thing. You say the word spirit in cities like Portland or San Francisco to a, a room with 10 people, and you'll, you'll actually, people will hear about 15 different things. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a very fuzzy word in our culture. And so many, many of you, Maybe you've grown up around the church, and so you hear Jesus talk about the Spirit, and you're like, yeah, the Spirit, whatever. And then maybe some of you are coming back to following Jesus after a long time, and you're, re- you're trying to rethink everything from the ground up, and you're like, Spirit, yeah, what is going on there? What is that about? Because your friends at work, they might use the word Spirit too, but they don't seem to mean the same thing that Jesus means. And just, and just for example, you know, last night... Uh, on mile 13 or whatever it was as we walked around the city. And uh, we were up um, in the fancy part. There's lots of fancy parts. But uh, on, on Polk, Polk Street near Lafayette Park. Anybody up there? We were up there for, to watch the sunset. It was really great up there. And as we came down, we were walking down uh, that hill. We passed by this really beautiful building called the Center for Science and Religion and Spirituality. You guys know? And it had this big banner out in the front on the front of the building that says, receive your message from spirit. And I was like, yes, exactly, right? So we have that building in Portland too. We have tons of them actually, you know? And so you, spirit. So it's a common English word that I think when we see it in the New Testament, we all have our stories and backgrounds of what, that, what spirit is or what that means. And we tend to just read that into say, the sayings of Jesus. So what I want to do today actually is kind of back up and just say, pause. Like when Jesus says spirit, he has a whole backstory in his head. He grew up immersed in a particular story in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. And the Hebrew scriptures develop this character of God's spirit starting on page one, as we're going to see in a second here. And when Jesus says spirit... He doesn't mean what most people in our culture mean when we say the word spirit. And you might even realize that he doesn't mean what you thought the word means. It means something actually very specific. And so as we kind of begin this Life with God series, we're talking about the personal presence of Jesus with us. And so I want to pause on Jesus' teachings and go back to the story that he just assumes that you know when he starts talking about the spirit. You guys with me? Okay, so when, so how, how do we want to start here? I invite you to grab a Bible, uh, turn to page one of, of the Bible. It should be very easy, easy for you to find. Um, and as, uh, or turn on your phones and scroll to page one or whatever, however you want to do that. Um, as, as you do that, let me, um, yes, let me show you a, a picture of my son, right? We're far away from him right now. And so um, this is my little guy, Roman. And um, maybe the lighting's not so good. Can you see that he's really interested in a little creature on the curb? That's a, that's a slug. It's a, a slug. Um, now, so this, trust me, trust me, this has to do with the spirit. Right? So March, April is, um, is slug season, right? It's a rainy season. It's, uh, a lot cooler than here and gray and spits on you and that kind of thing from the sky. And so lots of rain and the slugs come out. This is slug season. And my little son, Roman, he's three, and he's fascinated with these creatures. And they really are fascinating creatures, slugs. And so he, whenever he sees one, he he gets really jazzed and so he wants to do this, right? (laughs) Stare stare at it. Well, he's doing more than staring at it, but I'll talk about that in a second. So we're looking at the slug and he he asked me this question. He says, Dada, why is it going? 
And I thought to myself, oh, of course what he means is where is it going, you know? And I'm like, oh, it's like going down here, buddy. You know, surely he, he can't actually be asking why is it going. He's not a philosopher yet. He's three, you know? <laughs> so, so I corrected him. I was like, oh, oh, you mean where is it going, buddy? And then he corrected me. He was like, no, Dada, why is it going? <laughs> I mean, I'm totally serious. And I was, you know, and then I'm like, I think he's asking me that Really awesome. That's really awesome. I think he's asked me that question. And so, so then my brain went like, well, how do I want to frame this? How do I talk about this in a way, the meaning of the universe, right, to, to my <laughs> son talking about a slug? And, and so I was like, well, buddy. And then he was like, Dada, let's spit on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know if you can see, he has spittle on his lips and it's He's got a little puddle. He wanted the slug to go into the puddle of spit, and that's what he's <laughs> doing right there. And then I was like, back to your question. And he was like, oh, fire truck. And then he was off. And <laughs> next thing, whatever. But so, th so there you go. So put, put yourself in his shoes, right? Why is it, why is it going? <laughs> that's a remarkable little creature. Like what, Right? Like, what? I don't know what he meant by that question, to be honest with you, but I'm just going to act like he was asking about the meaning of the universe, right? So why? Like, why is it going? What makes it go? You know, there's slugs, and there's also salamanders. Those are incredible, too, and snakes, and all these other creatures. Like, what? On, what makes it go? Why is it going? If you would have asked that question to Jesus or to any Jewish person raised and immersed in the story of the Hebrew Scriptures, you would have gotten a very clear answer to that question. And the answer to that question would be, well, the Spirit. Spirit. What, you don't know? <laughs> spirit. Page one. Sentence one, even. Let's make this really easy for us, right? Sentence one. I'm just going to read the first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now... The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And who's there? Mm -hmm. There you go. Second sentence of the this, this must be an important character in the storyline of the Bible. Right? You have God in the first sentence and then spirit in the second sentence of the Bible. Spirit is there. Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And, and there was light. And it goes on. Okay, so let's just pause. So a million debates and controversies, whatever. Don't care about that right now. So what I, I want to ask a question of just who. Who? So first sentence. Who is the, the person behind the, the origins? Who is the author, the originator of all that exists, according to sentence one of the Bible? God. It's not a trick question. It's actually like a, so I'm a big fan of like look down at the page and just, you know, simple question. So, so God, okay. So, so you begin the story with God, makes everything. Uh, there's different views on how that sentence works. I view it as a, a title, but whatever. Just some, you might disagree with me. So the whole, it's, a bit, it's like an umbrella sentence over the whole story. What is the story about? In the, way back when, in the beginning, God made everything that is. Now, how did that happen? Let's get the story moving. And what you get is a story about earth. Don't think globe, just think land here. The land was formless and empty, and there's darkness over the surface of the deep, watery abyss. Now, just pause. We don't have time to talk about any of this, though it's totally fascinating. Does darkness, formless, and void, watery abyss, does this sound like a nice place to hang out? for you. you know, can you go like, have a picnic there with your friends and play, you know, frisbee in this case? Can you do that in a space like this? No. So whatever it is, it, it's, it's chaotic. It's wasteland. It's a place that can't, that can't sustain life. And so, who is there in the midst of very dark, chaotic environments, poised to bring about life and light and beauty and order. Who's there? Spirit of God. Now, just, just stop and, and scratch your head, right? and, and you'll, have, you'll be joining, you know, millennia 
a, a, a millennia long chain of Bible readers, right? right? Christian and then even pre-Christian and Jewish readers of like, what's going on here? Why doesn't it just say God was there amongst the dark water? Are you like, you have God made everything, right? In the beginning, God. So God makes everything. So how does that story actually work? Well, it began with this dark, chaotic, watery oasis, and who's there going to bring light and beauty and out of the darkness, spirit of God? Why doesn't it just say God? Are you with me? It's just a simple question, but like who, so who, 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 remember, who question? Who is responsible for the authoring and the originating and bringing order to our world? Who? God and so is this either or? Is it God or spirit? doesn't at all seem that way. So somehow, and even way back, you can go to pre-Christian interpretation of these early verses of the Bible. Jewish readers are scratching their heads going there. It seems as if the God who's being introduced in this story has some kind of inner complexity, some kind of inner plurality, inner distinction, because there's God and there's also spirit of God. They're distinct, but they're all it's the one true God of Israel in, in the scriptures. Now, so let's pause. You guys with me on the who question? Spirit's really important. That's all I, I could have just said that. I'm sorry, but I, you know, I go on. <laughs> so, all right, now, so what does this mean? If that's the who, what? What is spirit? And let's geek, geek out a little bit. I'll teach you some words. You may have come across these before, but why not do it again? So uh, in Hebrew, the word uh, that's being translated as spirit right here is the word ruach. And the, the K-H, it's the clear your throat letter, right? So say it with me. Ruach. You spit a little bit, right? <laughs> so ruach. And that, so that's in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, which is written... Uh, in, in Greek, uh, the word translated as spirit is pneuma. Pneuma. Class? <laughs> pneuma. Pneuma, right. So I, I'm one of those guys too. I do, I do that to people. I teach. Anyway, so, all right. So ruach and, and pneuma. So what, this is the who, what's the what? What is ruach? What is the ruach of God hovering there in the midst? Um, put uh, put your uh, hand up your mouth. Put your hand out and say something. Say hello. Hello. So you may realize you need a breath mint. It's okay. <laughs> All right? Just do it, bef do it before the service is over. So anyway, but hello. All right. No, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. But hand up because I want you to keep your hand right here. Hand up. When you say hello, hello, do you feel that? You feel something. Now, if you look down, do you see anything? No, you don't see anything, but you feel something on your hand. What is that? It's your, it's your ruach. That's your ruach. So what is that, right? So don't be a modern Westerner and be like, oh, it's vapor particles and carbon dioxide or whatever. <laughs> like, okay, no, it is. So when reading the Bible, it's a cross-cultural experience. You need to check your view of everything at the door and put yourself in this ancient author whom God used to speak his word to his people. And so when this author uses the word ruach, he doesn't mean carbon dioxide vapor particles, right? So what, so what is the ruach, right? Well, you can't see it, but it's, it's a very real thing that you can feel. And actually, well, so think of it this way. You go to uh, Dolores Park, also, what a wonderful place. And that playground, it actually made me want to have my kids here with me because that playground is, you guys know what I'm, the new playground? Unbelievable. So anyway, so you're in uh, Dolores Park and you're having a picnic, you're playing frisbee because it's not formless and void, watery chaos there. It's very beautiful and ordered. So you're playing frisbee and you notice that someone's passed out, unconscious, right in the middle of the park. And you're like, whoa, this is, actually happens every day, I'm sure. Right? Right? So you, uh, you, you go to the, what's the first thing you do? You go, run, what's the first thing you want to, you got to check their condition. What are you going to do? So, so you're going to, Pulse, right? So do this, check the pulse or whatever. Or you might also do first or it might be a little easier or whatever would be to what? Put your ear down to their mouth. And what are you, what are you trying to sense? You're trying to sense whether there's any ruach in this person. So ruach. What, so ruach is first and foremost, it's, it's breath, but it's not just vapor particles, right? Ruach is life. If there's no ruach, 
no life. Where there's ruach, there's life. No ruach, it's no life. You're welcome. <laughs> we all learned something today. So, so ruach, it's, it's invisible, but it's real. And your ruach is like this, it, it's breath, it, it's this animating life energy. You cannot see it. It's, it's your presence. It's, the, it's what sustains you and makes you alive. It's you. You're in your ruach. Your life is sustained. You, your body, you are animated by your ruach. It's as close a way to talking about you as talking about anything else. There's no Hebrew word for brain or, or something like that. Your ruach is what, it's part of the essence of you. It's your life. And it's invisible, which is also why you'd go out to Dolores Park and you'd see the trees moving. And you're like, what is, what, magic hands moving the trees? Like, what, what is that? What do we call that? What's moving the trees? We call it wind. In Hebrew, it's ruach. It's the same word. Do you see that? We have different words in English for these things. But in Hebrew, this is all one related idea. It's an invisible presence. It's invisible, but it's real. And it's in you. And it animates you. It's what makes you tick and what, and what makes you go. Are you guys with me here? Now, look, look back down. So how, so that's, that's part of the what. How does God's ruach do its thing, right? Do you see in verse 2, it's dark, it's chaotic, bad, right? The abyss. But the ruach, God's ruach, God's personal life presence, God's animating life presence is there poised and ready in the midst of these dark, chaotic circumstances. And how does God's ruach get released out into the chaos and begin to bring light and order and beauty? Look at verse 3. What does God do in verse 3? He speaks. He speaks. Put your hand up. Put your hand up right here. Yeah? So say, hello. Check your breath. <laughs> hello. So what are, you, what are you doing to release your ruach out of you? You, sp you speak. Speak. This is all. This is very intentionally crafted. All of the vocabulary, all of the words. Right? God speaks a word. It's it's God's word that carries His animating life energy out of God, so to speak, and into the world. And when God releases His ruach through His word, life happens. And that's how the story begins. You with me? And and. Jew Pre-Christian Jewish readers have paid attention and talked about this long before Christians ever did. <laughs> really. And I, I can give you the references if you're interested in Jewish literature. It's fascinating. People have scratched their heads for thousands of years over this. There's a reality to the one God revealed in the story of the Bible, but yet it's the one true God, but there's this inner complexity that there's God, and then there's God's ruach, which is his animating life presence that apparently he can speak speak through a word out into the world, and then that ruach can go and fill other creatures and animate them too. So, page two. Look at page two, right? Or, or chapter two. Oh, wait, no. Let me show you one thing. The poets, the poets of the Hebrew Scriptures paid attention to these stories. They meditated on, on these words. And so look at how the poet in Psalm 33 puts it. This is really remarkable. He says, for the word of, of Yahweh, that's the, the covenant name of God in, in the Old Testament. The word of Yahweh is right and true. He's faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The whole earth is full of his covenant love. So the whole earth is full of Yahweh's faithfulness and goodness. How? How is that the case? Well, listen, it's by the word of Yahweh that the heavens were made, their starry host by the ruach of his mouth. Do you see that? That's somebody who's really been paying attention to page one of the Bible and reflecting and thinking. The Ruach, the Ruach is God's second self, so to, to, or third self, right? It's, it's, it's God, but it's distinct. It's the Ruach of God. And when it's released by the word, it goes out and, and life happens. Page two, page two, or, or chapter two, just verse seven. It's just this little, this little snippet here again. Avoid the controversies, whatever. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. This is about God making humans. This is the image of God. It says the, 
chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed a human from the dust of the, of the ground. The word formed, it's using a, a word that is only ever used to describe a, a potter at a potter's wheel, spinning, spinning. It's doing this as the clay, as the wet clay takes shape. And so God, it's God molding a human, right, so to speak. It's a very powerful image. And so um, molding and forming, and then God has this pile of dirt. <laughs> so what does God do with the dirt? He, he breathes. Here it's a, a verb, action word. He ruachs <laughs> into the nostrils of this pile of dirt, the breath of life, and the human, the human, it's alive. <laughs> you know, he becomes, he becomes alive. It's very similar to the first sentences. You have lifelessness, and God breathes into lifelessness and makes, and makes life. And here, this is a statement about human nature, that we, we're dirt and divine breath. We're dirt and, and divine ruach. We, our origins are tied to the material world. From it, we come back to it, we go. But our life energy is a gift. Where did you get your ruach? So that's the question. Being, where did you get, where'd you get it? You know, did you make it for yourself? <laughs> you, know, you know, like if you have a chance to ever see humans being born, it's remarkable. And you will watch them take their first inhale of ruach. And it's so incredible because you're like, what? What? Why? Why does it go, Dad? Dad, right? Like, what is happening right here? And and that's that's exactly the question that's being posed in this story: is what makes it go? Ruach, God's ruach. You did not you did not make your ruach. In fact, you're all taking inhaling a breath right now as I'm finishing the sentence. Where is it yours? Did you make it for yourself? Like, no, but so human existence is a gift. Right? And, and the, the, the presence, the personal presence of the creator is every moment. It's not just that he wound up the universe and lets it go. Every moment I'm, I'm inhaling life. And it is not mine. Well, it's borrowed ruach. Right? Each of us is existing on, on borrowed ruach. And it's God's prerogative to give and to take that ruach. As the poet in uh, the book of Job, he puts it this way. He says, the ruach of God made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. If it were God's intention, yeah, he could withdraw his ruach and his breath, and all humanity would perish together. All mankind could return to, to the dust. Okay, and he's also been studying these first pages of the Bible okay, here. Okay. Why am I doing all of this right now? Here's why I'm doing all of this. When, you, when we hear the word spirit, right? So whether it's the Religion, Science, Spirituality Center up by Lafayette, Lafayette Park, right? In our culture, spirit can refer to ghosts. It can refer to a di disembodied, deceased, someone who's deceased or passed on. People mean that often by spirits in our culture. But up at the, I'm certain of it, up at the Religion, Science, and Spirituality Center, there's even another way of defining spirit, and that's of an impersonal energy, right? The Force, Star Wars fans, anybody? I was raised, raised, it formed my worldview, right, as I was growing up. And so, at the Force, right, it's this impersonal energy that, you know, surrounds us, penetrates us, binds the galaxy together, if you know the line, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, so it's, in, it's impersonal, right? And up to this point, uh, someone from the Religion, Science, Spirituality Center would be like, awesome, I love the Bible. This is really cool. That's right. It's the animating life energy of the divine and so on. And so what, as we come back to the teachings of Jesus, what sets Jesus' vision of spirit apart? And even like this, this is all just interesting ideas. At least I hope it's interesting. It's interesting to me. I'm having a good time. So I don't know if you are. So, so like what, is this, what does this actually mean? What does this mean for you? If you're a follower of Jesus and you believe that this ruach is like somehow involved with your life. So some of us, we, we might have more the, the American hodgepodge new age spirituality influence of our vision of spirits, the impersonal divine energy. 
For some of us, it might be identified with growing up in the church, and, and then there's all these camps and battle lines and so on, and so there's, there's some groups and churches, and they're all about the Spirit, and that's kind of weird. And then there's some that are not weird, but it's just different than I, and then there's some that are like God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Scripture, right? And there's just not a lot of vitality in that, and it just seems kind of like, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about here. So here you go. All I'm trying to do is say, what is the first thing that should come into your mind when you hear the word spirit come from Jesus' lips? That's what I'm asking, right? What's the first thing that should come into your mind? Jesus has a backstory in his head that he just assumes that you know. What is the vision of who the spirit of God is and what the spirit of God does? The first thing that should come into your minds is that the Spirit of God is life. And the Spirit of God is God's personal presence whose mission, whose very existence is for the purpose of, of inhabiting chaotic, dark environments and, and conveying the, the spoken word of God to bring life. When you think of Spirit, think Ruach, think life. And this is not something that's just like a past event. This is something that's sustained. I mean, every breath that we take, the Ruach, God's Ruach, is as close to us as the breath we're inhaling, as I'm saying, as I'm speaking right now. That's the vision in the Hebrew Scriptures. And, and, and it's a person. It's an actual person. And who is that person? In the story of the Hebrew Scriptures, that person is the God of Israel. And then you have someone like Jesus of Nazareth coming on to the scene, who says that he is, in fact, the very presence and the reality of the one true God of Israel become human, right? And, and he calls God his Father, and he calls himself the Son, but yet at the same time he says, yet I and the Father are one. And now he's saying, I'm going away. And you all think that's bad, because you're like, oh, it wouldn't be rad to like, sit next to Jesus and have fish with him or something, you know? And Jesus is like, no, actually, that's not the best setup, because right? I can only be in one place at one, one time. If, if the movement of Jesus is about the renewal of human beings and all humanity, then this thing has to go global, and it has to go viral, so to speak. And, and if that's going to happen, then Jesus' way of being with his people requires the entry of this new character in the Jesus story, spirit, spirit. And Jesus is going, but then the spirit is coming. And then Jesus says, yeah, I'm actually not going. I'm just coming. In the, you get it? Remember that saying from the beginning? Okay, so we're back here again. That's where we're at. The, the spirit is the very personal life-giving and sustaining presence of the Father and of the Son, the Spirit specializes in inhabiting dark, chaotic environments and creating life and bringing order and bringing beauty. You guys with me here? And the Spirit will always lead us back to Jesus. Always lead us back to Jesus. Look at, here's the last thing I'll show you. Another thing, Je oops, sorry, next one. Never did that one, that's okay. And next, next one, yep, just skipping that. <laughs> just editing on the spot, all right, okay. Look at, what, look at what he says there, this is really significant. He says, all, all of this I have spoken while I'm right here with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. What does that mean? So it's the Spirit, but what is the Spirit here to do? The Spirit here is here to draw attention to the word that God has spoken through the Son. And he's going to teach you all things and remind you of everything I said to you. Peace I leave with you. It's my peace I'm giving to you. I don't give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't, don't be afraid. Do you see here? The, spirit, the Spirit's role is not to draw attention to itself. The Spirit is the very personal life-giving presence sent from the Father in the name of the Son to bring beauty and life and order to chaotic environments by reminding us of Jesus 
in his presence and his teachings. Are you with me here? So what this means, what this means is that there might be all kinds of things that, that you sense that you could do or ought to do as a follower of Jesus. And you might even sense a certain, like, the stars have aligned and crazy circumstances and whoa. But, but for a follower of Jesus, it's not just about trusting my gut and that there's divine energy pushing me in this direction, right? Because remember, the spirit is not a force. It's not just simply an energy. And it's certainly not like my desires projected out onto the universe, right? And then I just call it spirit. The spirit is a per- it's, it's Jesus, right? The friend who, who calls the spirit portable Jesus. And, I, <laughs> and I, I'm not quite, I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually mostly happy with that. I would make a few clarifications, but it's a good, it's a good working definition. It's the, the spirit, it's, it's distinct from Jesus, but yet it, it conveys Jesus' presence and it will always bring you back to Jesus. Are you guys with me here? The spirit is life. The spirit is the presence of the creator. The spirit is the word and teaching and presence of Jesus with his disciples. You and I, we go throughout our days, and so here we are. This is where I am sit down now with you and, and, and need to hear what I'm saying, is that we, we go through our days, and we, somehow we just like are clueless that Jesus is actually with us. You might say, of course, like Jesus is with me, but it's like we don't live like that. <laughs> you know? We don't actually, we don't recognize the presence of Jesus with every breath that I inhale. Like imagine if you went through a day disciplining yourself every five minutes to be like, yeah, that one came from Jesus. You know, no, that one too. And like, it's the personal presence of Jesus. And in Jesus' mind, the way that his teachings convey life and, and, and order into our lives is, is, is precisely to the degree that we become aware and open ourselves to be influenced by the presence of the Ruach, of Jesus' Ruach. And so, so let me land the plane. And here's where I um, want us to, to, to be for our time of taking the bread and the cup and our time of worship, worshiping. And this, this image is very powerful on, on page one of the Bible. We live in a, a very unpredictable world our lives and the stories that we're all bringing in here, the doors, the, the relationship crisis that you're in right now, the, the sick family member, the person that passed away in the last seven days, right? Since the last time we, you, know, you guys gathered together, there's so much pain, there's so much darkness and abyss and void in our world, in our world at large and in your story that you brought in the doors today. And Jesus is trying to tell us that he is committed to being personally present with us and that he's real. And that if if we open our eyes and and become open to being influenced by the personal presence of Jesus, he actually has power to speak life into the chaos of your life. He actually has the power to bring order out of the the chaos. Some of us in the last seven days have, have introduced moral chaos into our lives by stupid decisions that you said you wouldn't make again and then you did it again and you know that's not who Jesus is calling you to be, but here you are again. <laughs> and you feel it's just a mess and you're like, where am I right now? And Jesus, you, you need to know that Jesus is absolutely committed to you and he's committed to being personally present with you to bring order and goodness to the chaos that's in your life. Do you actually believe that? So that's the question. Like, do you actually believe that? This isn't just like ancient ideas. This is a a real person that we're gathered here. And Jesus said that when we gather, he's uniquely available and present with us in a special way. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition. We're going to have a time, a prayer of reflection of taking the bread and the cup together, and I just, I don't know most of you, right? I don't know your stories. Jesus knows your story. He's not limited like I am up here. He's present with you, and I, let's just make this our prayer. Let's just, let's open, open yourself to the Spirit and allow the Spirit to give you insight to a place of chaos in your life right now, to a place of darkness, 
that nobody else knows about, but you know about it. Jesus knows about it. The Spirit knows about it. Let's open ourselves up to the chaos that we see in our world and the fear, the anxiety that it causes in us. And let's just invite the personal presence of Jesus to bring hope and to bring healing, to bring his commitment to forgive and to bring beauty out of, out of the trash that we've all contributed to the world this week. Let's invite the, 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 the creator spirit, the presence of Jesus, his life-giving ruach. Let's in, invite the spirit to speak new lives into our lives that we feel depleted and anxious and tired. Amen?